socialist era. It was the centrally planned economy. Basically, the thinking was that uh, people will not have the private cars. There will not be so much, so much uh, residential housing development. So that's why the city was really built on the notion that uh, there will be the public transportation. There will be not so many private cars. So the city was really planned for half a million people. This is how the streets of the capital city of one of the least populated countries in the world looks like today. Much has changed in Ulaanbaatar since the days of its former socialist past. Like everywhere else, time changes people and places. But here in Ulaanbaatar, the changes seem to be happening faster than the city can cope with. And as a city, Ulaanbaatar faces many challenges today. growth of Ulaanbaatar city population is the major issue that is being faced by Ulaanbaatar city itself and since 1990s uh, the population of Ulaanbaatar has doubled and now the population has increased uh, to 1.2 million. Mongolia has a total population of less than 3 million inhabitants, half of whom now live in Ulaanbaatar with numbers increasing every day and this in a city originally planned and designed to accommodate less than 600,000 inhabitants. Ulaanbaatar is growing tremendously as a city in the last few years. We have more than 40 to 50,000 migrants coming into the town per year and you can imagine that uh, the urban services cannot cope with this number of migrants coming into the city. Large-scale migration from Mongolia's rural areas to Ulaanbaatar over the years have changed the way the city looks. This huge exodus has been driven by complex socio-economic, political and environmental factors that go a long way beyond people simply seeking to experience life in the big city. After privatization, yeah, uh, many factories and uh, this uh, state-owned enterprises basically got bankrupt and then there were more unemployed people, yeah. Uh, in uh, other parts of, of the country, so they started to move uh, into the city. There were several factors that led to this situation when the severe winter zoot, we call it zoot, resulted on the loss of the cattle by many herdsmen. In addition to that, many rural areas are underserved in terms of the social and other services. So people have started moving to Lombard looking for better lives and for better opportunities. The explosion in the population of Ulaanbaatar and the rapid economic development of the last few years have seen two parallel expansions happening simultaneously within the city limits. We have kind of a dual city, so to say. We have the modern part of the city that is the heart in the city where you are right now. This is expanding tremendously. We see all the, the new buildings being put up. This is sort of the formal sector of the city. And then on the other hand, we have the Ghat districts, which are also expanding on the outskirts of the city, in particular in the north of the city. Uh, there, of course, this is, I would call it the informal part of the city. Uh, there are the problems we are having right now because these, uh, this part of the city is not connected to the central grid system with regard to heating, with regard to water provision and with regard to sewage. So you can imagine what kind of environmental problems this is causing more and more. Currently, only around 40% of Ulaanbaatar's residents are connected to the central grid system. There are four power plants to heat the homes of those who are connected to the central grid and to supply the entire city's power demand. With increasing pressure on the current grid, experts are skeptical of just how much longer the current system can hold. The majority of the infrastructure, water supply, heating, power supply and wastewater pipelines have been built before 1990s. So with the huge migration of people to Lombardia now, this facility, these services are no longer um, yeah, sufficient to meet all the demands all the, and provide uh, adequate services to the entire population of the city. Overall, one can say that 
there's a leakage of up to 50% in the grid system. And there has been not much of maintenance and repair work in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, UB city government and the government as such is starting with it. Uh, I would say without repair, uh, this grid system uh, uh, is nearly at, uh, well, nearly coming to an end of its capacity. Apart from issues of power demand and supply, one particular aspect of life in Ulaanbaatar is increasingly becoming the bane of residents in the city. I'm a resident of Ulaanbaatar and uh, I can see a lot of changes going on happening in Ulaanbaatar in the last two decades especially. In my point of view, the main challenge for Ulaanbaatar is traffic congestion. The number of vehicles is being growing by 25% annually. The majority of these uh, cars are second-hand, poor-performing uh, uh, cars, which generate a lot of emission. Uh, the traffic has been, it's, it's, it's really hard. For example, from the Dyson to city, it's uh, more than one hour. And it's only like 3.5 kilometers. It's ridiculous. Zaisan area in the south of Ulaanbaatar is considered a prime residential area with some of the most expensive real estate in town. But with inner city commute turning into a nightmare, demand is taking a different swing. Now, Zaisen was the like, second biggest area, like everybody wants to live in that area, but uh, not everybody wants to like, spend like one hour to, to get home. So living in the center is convenient for them, walking to the offices and to the supermarkets. From the last year, the apartment price has gone up, up to 25%, especially the apartments in the central located apartments, its price is going up. Summer in Ulaanbaatar is something everyone living in the world's coldest capital city looks forward to. As sunny spots tempt residents outside, it's easy to forget one of the biggest wintertime scourge for Ulaanbaatar residents. And it's not just about punishing temperatures that dip below minus 40 degrees Celsius. In terms of wintertime air pollution quality, Ulaanbaatar city is the most polluted city. Central heating reaches less than half the homes in Ulaanbaatar, leaving Gare district residents to heat their homes with the most common fuel available, raw coal. Recent years have seen various projects trying to promote the use of less polluting fuels and better quality stuffs, but despite millions having been spent, Ulaanbaatar has still a long way to go to tackle this huge challenge of chronic winter pollution. But with warmer days ahead, this often becomes a quickly forgotten problem, that is, till the next winter. With summer, streams and rivers begin to flow again, but this welcoming sight is also the reminder of another huge environmental problem on the threshold. Ulaanbaatar is, is drying out. There's, you know that we're in the area where desertification because of climate change is really showing its impact already. And as the rain only anyhow is 200 millimeters per year, uh, and that only concentrated in the month of June and July, uh, you can imagine that uh, water is getting scarce. New wells will have to be drilled. The current water supply in Ulaanbaatar is marked by a huge disparity between apartment dwellers and Gare district residents. And a water shortage could only magnify this gap. For the Gare areas, this uh, consumption, water consumption is 6-8 litres per day per person. In the apartment there is 220 and 300 litres per day per person. But it was much higher before. There is no doubt Ulaanbaatar faces daunting infrastructural challenges, but a few solutions are underway to address some of the larger issues. This brand new flyover, built with assistance from the Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA, is expected to ease some of the strain on Peace Bridge, currently the main bridge being used to connect to the south of the city and also the main route to the international airport. Agencies like the United Nations and the World Bank have been actively working towards improving water distribution network in Gare areas, with kiosks and pump stations like this one, built under a World Bank project. A host of NGOs, both local and international, have also actively contributed to improving services in Gare areas. In the power sector, 
The Asian Development Bank is also undertaking a project to construct a brand new power plant number no. 5 with private sector partnership to meet increasing power demand. Private sector development is one of the key drivers of change for the Asian Development Bank. And in Mongolia particularly, Asian Development Bank is planning to attract private sector in the development of a combined heat and power plant number no. 5. This is a new facility which is being built in the suburb of the Ulaanbaatar city. Across Ulaanbaatar, international donors and aid agencies seem to be running the show when it comes to devising solutions for the city's infrastructure problems. The private sector is also playing an increasingly important role. The pressure is now on for the local government to step in and play a more proactive role. Only 10 years ago, the overall economy was one billion dollar economy, and the whole state budget was only about 400, 500 million dollars. The whole country's budget. So it was, it would, so uh, traditionally, you know, the donor agencies and donor countries has been trying to help with the infrastructure needs, but I think more and more, uh, Mongolian government itself and the whole better government will be able to both fund and take the initiative for the infrastructure projects. In 2007, Mongolia had only 2,500 kilometers of paved roads, according to an UN report. And this from its official road network of over 40,000 kilometers. With an economy that grew by 17% in 2011, many believe lack of funds will no longer be a reason for overlooking infrastructure development across the country. During the last few years, the government is really having this um, huge increase in uh, the uh, mining revenues in terms of taxes and royalties. Yeah. So the main challenge is really to, uh, how to spend those uh, funds in uh, productive way to invest in infrastructure, to invest in human development, so funds used wisely accelerates even more growth. In recent months, the City Council has taken a few steps in the right direction in dealing with some of the city's pressing issues. The Selbe River Restoration Project is one such initiative. With warmer months, frantic maintenance work can be seen across the city. But when functioning sidewalks are refitted every year, and holes dug up to service the city's public fountains, one can't help but wonder about the management loopholes in the system and if resources are being correctly utilized. No management, there's a lot of people not talking to shit, but you shake you here, you hit the auto process, not the petrol horn that's a cherry. The intended task of the book has sort of the government is tender, the procedure not the tongue that I wish for tender, the other thing of Jerem Shik, the Tonat Tartu was of Yetana or the Bukun Toro Hitzenberg, the Yammer Campan, Yajal Hamid Zimberg, and says the Hitcher did with Sihato, Agitic. It is a big problem, but legally, again, we progressed quite a bit. We passed anti-corruption legislation in 2006. A new anti-corruption agency was created in 2007. All the high-level public officials and medium level public officials have to declare their income and assets and it, it is an open uh, access to information since 2007 and we recently passed a legislation on conflicts of interest and many things are progressing legally. It's a question of uh, hard day-to-day -day work of implementing, enforcing legislation but I think um, actually corruption these days is high risk than a few years ago. The task list to improve the lives of Ulaanbaatar's residents is almost endless and one with many dimensions. We have to think about decentralized solutions with regard to water, with regard to heat uh, and energy. And we will, with regard to water, of course, have to think about new technologies with regard to recycling. I'm talking about grey water recycling, I'm talking about black water recycling. In order to just build sewerage system in gear areas, it is required a big investment and special technical solution to be uh, provided this all water and sewerage systems. That's why the, today gear area residents using like just uh, dry pit latrines. So there is a strong need to improve public transport system which is affordable, which is safe and comfortable for the residents and the passengers of the system. If there is the very good roads in these gear areas, then in this case this traffic 
will be not not too terrible as, as like as today yeah? and so this improvement of uh, the, the infrastructure and gear areas is a really crucial issue very crucial issue there is a need for affordable housing definitely but on the other hand you see all, you see a lot of empty buildings you see all these huge apartments in the south which are not at all occupied. A lot of them are not occupied. Of course, they might not be affordable enough, that's a problem, but I mean, uh, people might have to lower their prices, and I do that. Finally, the construction sector, the contractors, they have profit margins of 30% and more. In the midst of all these challenges, Ulaanbaatar has recently signed on to one of the country's biggest infrastructure projects, and one expected to cost about 350 million US dollars. The construction of a brand new airport, the location around 60 kilometers from downtown Ulaanbaatar. With increasing international air traffic to Mongolia and the limitations of the current airport, many people are convinced that this is an essential project. This Chingshan airport is really the uh, this topography or location is not that good. It basically, it is squeezed by mountains, yeah, and then uh, basically uh, for big air airplanes, basically you need to descend at very short uh, uh, distance, so it, it's not so convenient. A brand new airport could certainly help better place Mongolia on international flight routes. But hopefully, Ulaanbaatar as a city can also one day raise the amount of investment required to meet the basic needs of more than half the city's population. It's clear the road to real development for Mongolia, and one not just measured by the number of expensive cars that clog Ulaanbaatar streets, is going to take real commitment to the task and a proper check on issues of corruption and inefficient management that Mongolia is struggling to bypass. You know, Chinggis Khan apparently said it's easy to conquer the world on the horse. It's much more difficult to get down from the horse and rule the country. So I think uh, during the last 20 years of transition, we have done a lot of reforms, legal and other institutional and other reforms. Now, um, more or less, we feel the transition is over with those reforms. It's a question of now doing this hard day-to-day -day work, you know. And despite all these problems and challenges, Ulaanbaatar is still a city that continues to draw many people with its opportunities and unique heritage. For after all, this is the capital city of what was once the world's greatest empire. And perhaps with the right kind of commitment and honest leadership, Ulaanbaatar can live up to the challenges it faces as a city today.